Hi everyone! Today is going to be another new to me singer, one which I'm not really familiar with the name. Uh, I think it's Björk. Björk? I hope I'm saying it correctly. Of course, saying that I'm not very familiar with it isn't saying much, considering once upon a time I didn't know who Freddie Mercury was, so I won't judge anything until I've heard the singer. I don't even know, is it a he, she, Björk? It's a we'll she. find out. It's a she. Okay. You can always check out my Coffee and Patreon pages if you want to support this journey as I explore artists, bands, music that is new to me, focused on rock music. Occasionally I veer one way or the other, but it's primarily rock music because that is the field I have really been vastly underexposed to, unexposed to, through most of my life, until about a year ago. And let me also tell you that I get so many requests on my channel. Can you listen to this? Will you please listen to this? And I so appreciate those requests and those recommendations. And and Vlad is always keeping tabs on them to kind of add them to the listening list and decide which ones are ones that I should pay attention to. But if there's one that you really desperately want me to hear, you can always go to my coffee page and commission a listen. So that's always an option if you really want something. Well, having said that, let me see what I have to find out about this Björk and what this music is all about this morning. Noted for her distinct voice and three octave vocal range, Björk, um, I'm going to say Björk G because I don't know how to pronounce this last name. I don't even know the proper names of the characters. Is an Icelandic singer, songwriter, composer, recorder, producer, and actress. Several of Björk's albums have reached the top 20 on the US Billboard 200 chart. 31 of her singles have reached the top 40 on pop charts around the world, with 22 top 40 hits in the UK. Her accolades and awards include the Order of the Falcon, five Brit Awards, and 16 Grammy nominations. In 2015, Time named her one of the 100 most influential people in the world. Rolling Stones named her the 64th greatest singer and the 81st greatest song songwriter of all time in 2023. Hyper Ballad, interesting name, I almost thought I was going to be reading Hyperbole. Hyper Ballad was released as the fourth single from her second solo album, Post, in 1995. It was lauded by the contemporary music critics who considered it the best song of Björk's career at the time. This is going to be interesting. Let's see what it sounds like.
Maybe you see the look of confusion and um, surprise on my face. So, this first verse, let me back up a little ways. When I was a child, my father would sometimes get fed up with the way we would leave trash around or or be careless with where we placed things and, and he, he really didn't approve of, of sloppy, sloppy housekeeping, shall we say, or littering of any kind. But he was a very tactful person. And so he wrote a, a story for story time about this family that lived at the top of a mountain. No, actually, I'm wrong. About this family that lived at the bottom of a cliff. And there was this strange phenomenon that happened at random intervals. And that is that sometimes the sky would be raining garbage down on their heads. And it, the story, it was a simple children's story he wrote. But the idea is that one day um, they got some visitors, drove in the driveway, and turns out those visitors lived at the top of the mountain and they had gone on a little uh, outing. They drove down the mountain and saw this uh, other dwelling place and they drove in and thought they would get acquainted. And while they're talking, some piece of litter sprinkles down out of the sky and the visitors are astonished and the na the the bottom of the cliff dwellers tell them um yeah it happens around here we don't know but it, we spend all our time picking up garbage because it just comes it's a strange thing that happens here and anyway long story short it was a revelation to the visitors who happened to live at the top of the mountain and their way of keeping their yard clean was to toss their litter over the edge. So as I was listening to this first verse, I was like, wait, what? Did, did he? I thought he wrote that story himself. Did he borrow it from somewhere? Did he, did he listen to the song Once Upon a Time? I really highly doubt it. He is not the type to listen to anything other than a, a very select narrow subset of musical styles, but, and this is not one of them. So I don't think this is where he got his inspiration from, but it was so similar. The story, we live on a mountain right at the top, this beautiful view from the top of the mountain. Every morning I walk towards the edge and throw little things off, like car parts, bottles and cutlery or whatever I find lying around. It's become a habit, a way to start the day. I go through all of this before you wake up so I can feel happier to be safe up here with you. Now maybe you understand what my confusion was as I was listening to the first verse. <laughs> and now I cannot get that connection out of my mind, of course, because it's a story I grew up being told by my dad. Anyway, this is going a little bit different now. It's taking a little bit more of a, less of a careless turn, more of a deliberate um, turn. This is something intentional someone is doing and it seems they have some sort of mm, inner struggle and it's their way of coping uh, because they do this every day to, in order to feel happy, to feel safe up here on top of this beautiful mountain. They recognize it's beautiful, but they have to go through this ritual every morning in order to be able to be in the right frame of mind. And part of that ritual 
is thinking some rather dark thoughts. And when I throw things off, I listen to the sounds they make on their way down. And I follow with my eyes until they crash. I imagine what my body would sound like slamming against the rocks. Well, is that a, a someone fighting some demons? Or is that just a thought that comes when you're standing at the edge of a cliff and you think, oh, I don't want to fall down there. And sometimes perhaps your imagination runs away from you and you start thinking, what would it be like? What would it sound like? Would it, how would it end? I don't know. But this has been kind of a surprise up until this point. Well, let's talk about the music for a moment. Distinctive is a very good descriptor for this voice. It almost sounds amateurish, but not quite. It's intentionally sounding that way. It almost sounds childish, but not quite. It almost sounds different things, but not quite. It somehow lives in its own sound world. There's something different about it. It actually comes across as engaging. Although it would be very easy for it to sound whiny or unpleasant, but somehow the balance works really well here. And it's the same thing about the instrumental mix. It could easily sound... Well, it doesn't sound terribly difficult from kind of electronic style music, and yet this doesn't have quite that electronic sound. There's somehow enough of an acoustic feel, a natural feel. It's, it's kind of like the difference between an imaginary icy world that you might see in a fairy tale and stepping out actually into an icy world, which is really fairy tale-like in many ways. But there's something very real and immediate about it. And somehow this has an element of reality and immediacy to it in its soundscape. Rather suitable for someone from Iceland, was it? Iceland. So maybe she's borrowing from her, from her own landscape and environment in the way she builds her uh, s sound world for her music. And when it lands, will my eyes be closed or open? I go through all this before you enter, so I can feel happier to be Echoing from one mountain to the other. Sounds a bit more electronic-y, doesn't it? I think it's the strings that help 
rescue it from sounding too nervous and electronic jittery. That was an interesting experience for me. I guess I want to go back and listen to the opening again now that I've kind of gotten my bearings and and um, followed the story all the way through, and we'll see how, how where it takes us. So I like the sort of. Um, wooden feeling of these strings and I'm guessing they're probably synthesized strings but they have this they have this sound you know there are different ways of playing violin strings most often we play it with the hair of the bow but occasionally for a special sound effect a composer will ask the performer to turn the bow over and play with the wooden stick part. And it gives a very unique kind of s a thin, sort of scratchy, wooden quality. This doesn't quite go that far, but it has that little bit of, of thin, uh, scratchy, a little bit rough and nasally quality. Just one of the things that to me sets up a sort of cold feeling. Cold. This There's nothing in the lyrics to tell us that this is a winter scene. So I'm not sure if it's meant to convey that. It could also simply mean kind of a shivery, cold mountain air, or it could, it could, the feeling of when the sun is first coming up and we're on the mountaintop and, and the cold kind of seeps into you. Everything is a little bit, um, un, unwelcoming in the degree of warmth that exists. Or it could be something like it's it's the cold mountain stream, the cold water in the mountain. To me, this sound is cold, cold. But the next sound that comes in after this cold, scrapey sound of the strings is this very deep, deep, warm, round bass. Such an interesting contrast in sonic qualities, isn't it? We have this thin, scratchy, scrapey sound in the strings and then a warm bass. From the beginning, we are being primed to, to feel and to interpret the music as a multi-textured, uh, multi-direction, even multi-dimensional soundscape. Not just from the tonal qualities, but also the pitch, because first we have this very high pitch it's high, it's screechy, way up at the top, and then boom. So we've suddenly, we've suddenly placed kind of 
the ceiling and the floor. Or shall we say the sky and the depth at the bottom of the cliff. We are looking a long ways top to bottom. And that's the kind of the parameters of the canvas on which this music is written, isn't it? That's the next thing we hear. And having gone through and now understanding what the story is about, if we wanted to be, and don't get me wrong, music is not always like this. Music is, doesn't always intend to be like this, and, and we don't even have to take this one like this. But it's kind of fun to play the game. And it's a game that I play a lot with my students as, as I try to get them to really develop their imagination and their way of um, different ways of relating to sound and perceiving sound so that they can build more expressivity and a deeper understanding of of the music they're listening to and playing and that is can we can we link the sounds we're hearing to th that we're hearing to other ideas or actions or senses. That's kind of what I'm doing right here at the beginning, isn't it? I'm thinking depth and height, a scratchy, wooden, warm and round. And now, as the drums come in, knowing the story, the first thing that comes to mind is, is this some trash clattering down the mountain cliff, you know, just bouncing and tumbling and, and um, flying down to the bottom. It could be. Imagine listening to this and thinking of that as as the trash being thrown over the edge. It starts to sound rather trash-y, doesn't it? Down it goes, down it goes. That's only one way of interpreting it. It could also be something like the texture of the leaves or the grass or the gravel or, or, or simply portraying, simply conveying um, activity because it has this sort of pulse. It pulses at the beginning of each bar and then it kind of peters out a little bit. And so, well, that's one of the things that gives it sort of a falling down quality, which I think fits pretty well with the story. But you can take it other ways as well if you wish. Having said all of that, what else is there musically in this introduction to this point? Mostly long held pitches. We have, we have, okay, the bass is walking between two notes. We've got the C and we have the D sharp, E flat, however you wish to call it. The strings are just uh, droning on F, B, A, A sharp, B flat. That's it. So we just have a little bit of shifting of the coloring. And of course the drums are just sticking on whatever pitch you want to hear from them. And that's mostly what happens throughout the piece. There is not a lot of harmonic changing, neither is there a lot of melodic stuff happening in the instruments most of the time. Which is why when the voice comes in, it sticks out to us. It's something we grab onto as as a as a pathway on which we can travel. Because suddenly there is a track through all of this textural stuff and static quality of the piece. Notice how it affects us as we step into it. Beautiful view from the top of the mountain. 
it's not a really highly developed melody. We live on the mountain, right at the top. Something like that, right? Just a few notes, but somehow because they're traveling a little bit and there's a little bit of a, an undulation happening and we hear the phrase at the top rounding out towards the end, we latch onto it as, as, a, as a pathway that we're traveling. At the same time, at least at the beginning here, it doesn't take us far. It places us right at the top of the mountain and we don't really go anywhere yet. The next thing that enters, of course, is this beautiful um, bell-like quality from the electric piano. Again, it's a synth sound imitating some percussive uh, pitched instruments. And we might at first say that it sounds a bit melodic. It does. But as we go on, we start to notice that it's kind of, again, just filling out the mid range, the mid upper range of our top to bottom and adding a sort of harmonic texture because now we're, we're filling out some of the chord tones. So all of this, why am I talking about this? Because this is what sets up the entire piece. This is what our ears hear first as we enter this piece of music. And where it sends us after that, and as we get more towards the end, I said it sounds more electronic -y style, but this is what we hear first. And this is why we perceive it as something kind of peaceful, gentle, beautiful, um, all of those things because it has these particular qualities and musical elements that point us that direction. And it influences, it influences our entire perspective of the piece. Listen to her voice. I go through all this. If I were going to describe the sound quality of her voice, the tone quality of her voice, I would say that it is the neighbor to the strings. The strings have that really raspy, high, squeaky sound. Her voice has a little bit of raspiness to it, doesn't it? And it's a little bit thin. It goes towards almost too thin, but not quite. And she does have a, a good range. And as we were just going, going into this next part, it gets more powerful, but it always has this unique quality of a little bit of raspiness. And that's why I would call it the neighbor to the strings, not so much as the strings, but it's, it, it's one of the reasons that I think that this song works so well, because we have, it sets her voice on a nice background. I don't know how much I would enjoy listening to this voice in a lot of different contexts, but in this context, I do find it pleasant and sort of engaging, interesting, enjoyable. She has a little touch of vibrato on some of the long notes. Um, the other thing that she does is she enunciates her words very precisely. And that links her singing to the percussion side of things. So she is being embraced and supported by two very contrasting sound qualities in the instruments. And yet, her voice is the meeting point. It's the thing that binds it all together. So sonically, I find it kind of nice to listen to. And then as far as the lyrics go, 
I don't find them deeply profound or anything like that, but they're not unpleasant, they're not weird, they're not unsettling, um, but they, they are a bit thought-provoking, aren't they? It depends on what we think of them, but maybe it's partly because of my childhood memories of my father's story, but somehow it makes, it, it feels like a, a very sweet way of saying, think about what you do to put yourself in your right mind. And is that something that is perhaps not helpful, possibly even damaging to the environment around you? Are we, are we going to make ourselves feel safe and prepare ourselves to stay happy in a way that requires us to throw things away all the time? Um, or is that a different way of saying, I'm going through all the baggage and clutter in my life and I'm discarding everything that is irrelevant and meaningless and unhelpful so that I can be my best self. There are both of those ways of approaching this, aren't there? And it's up to us to decide which one we want to take or perhaps take both of those meanings if we find them both helpful. Maybe there are some other interpretations of it too, but it's, it's, a nice, it's a nice balance of easy listening, interesting sonic setup, some ideas that can kind of get our thoughts turning in, in a direction that might be good for us to think from time to time. And at the same time, it's not really heavy and, and deeply challenging. It's something we could listen to easily in the background, or if we're playing with small children, kind of a happy-ish song. If we're driving and we just want something to help us get down the road, it strikes me as that type of music. And in that regard, I think it does a really good job. So there I have my first exposure to Björk. I still won't try to pronounce her last name. If anybody wants to, knows how to say it properly and wants to spell it out to me um, phonetically in the comments, I'll keep my eyes open there. Maybe I'll learn something new. And I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts on the piece as well. I'll see you soon.